Bitcoin has gotten to the point where it's so international, so decentralized. There are nodes all over the place. There are exchanges. There are people trading in it that one single country, not the U.S. or even the European Union, can shut it down by itself. When you look at Swissborg, 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 Swissborg is sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the market. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fee. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. In a fast-moving and confusing crypto asset market, get an edge with Crypto Slate Edge. Enhanced, in-depth news coverage and extensive crypto asset and sector data are all part of your exclusive access as a member, helping you understand the market with features such as on-chain metrics and sentiments, all of which allow you to convert knowledge into action with an ad-free experience. As a bonus, access our private Telegram channel to receive live insights whilst engaging with the CryptoSlate community. Subscribe now at CryptoSlate.com forward slash edge. Dear Crypto Queen and Blockchain Buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Roger Wong from Code Love, an educator, writer, human rights activist, Forbes contributor, someone who doesn't look at the tech only from a technological perspective, but we're going to look at things from a broader range of spectrum, such as political, cultural, social, the impact on the community. And without further ado, before we kick off though, a big shout out to Nate from Crypto Slate and our dear partners for always making amazing summarized articles of these interviews. So don't forget to check them out. They have one of the best cryptocurrency websites in the space. So without further ado, once again, thanks so much for coming on the show, Roger. How are you doing today? Doing great. Uh, looking forward to you know answering these different questions and, and really diving deep into these different topics. Amazing, amazing. So first and foremost, I'd love to ask you about your passion regarding coding, regarding open source code. A more general question to kick off. You were just telling us a little bit about it, if you don't mind sharing that love that you have for code and, and its impact on society. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I had to come from somewhere where I didn't go to computer science school. I didn't go to like a, you know, a formal CS education. But I, even when I was in school, I was starting all these different startups and I realized the power of just code and power being able to build and create things. And so I got involved with this company called Springboard, actually, which uh, at one point, or I think is one of the largest boot camps for teaching data science, UX design, new tech skills. Um, and I kind of dog fooded the product and then learned machine learning, machine learning learned data science, data science, learned Python uh, and everything um, just to be able to understand more. Um, and it got me down this rabbit hole of, open source technology. And I, I would say that I'm not just passionate about, you know, I, I build a lot of tutorials for Code Love. I built a lot of tutorials with Springboard. Um, and these cover everything from, you know, basic JavaScript to more advanced kind of machine learning algorithms on the Python side. Um, and so I'm very passionate about, you know, being able to build things. Um, for example, I built um, a classifier that was able to look at bootcamp reviews and try to infer uh, the gender composition of the boot camps. So um, just as like a cool little project. So I'm really passionate about that kind of stuff and being able to empower other people to do that. But it's not just even the technology itself. It's really the community and just the open source approach, right? The, the, the idea that people can come from around the world. to so kind of a decentralized consensus um, where your contribution was what matters and you're able to build something really meaningful and magic together. And that to me, um, is, is really appealing to me and, and, and quite honestly led me down 
eventually down the rabbit hole of, uh, of Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies. That is super cool. It makes a lot of sense. Open, open source, decentralized future, the code itself. Is that what code love means to you? Is like code the universal language of love because it has no borders, is completely open and decentralized like Bitcoin, for instance. Is that the, the idea behind code love? Honestly, I just thought it was kind of like a snazzy name. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, some of the seed of that is the idea that like, it's code, but also code that has an impact and meaningful impact, right? Like, I mean, obviously with code, you can build pretty much anything. And I think the idea, even from the beginning, uh, even with the idea of code, uh, parentheses love, uh, was really to code in ways that created impact beyond just an app, right? I didn't want to just create, not that there's anything wrong with this, but I didn't want to just create like another to-do app, stuff like that. I really wanted to see, okay, can we use code to empower different people if they learn it, you know, can they actually find their footing um, in, in this new economy? Uh, but also really thinking through like, okay, can we build things that can meaningfully address social, political, uh, broader issues beyond just the technical? And so you mentioned the impact on society, on people. What are some examples of your favorite topics that actually have an impact, a social impact, thanks to, you know, decentralized uh, assets such as Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, are there any specific parts that really captured your attention and your interest? Yeah, I mean, I guess let me start off first by saying that you, I was an economics major coming in to uh, 2008, 2009, that the Great Recession. Um, and so even just the original, I mean, just even the original genesis of, of decentralized consensus around finance and trying to understand what went wrong on that is, is something that's that's very appealing to me. I don't, I don't wanna, that's kind of like a, I have two very specific other examples, but like that's kind of just one thing I always like to start off with. Like, I think that is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and I think a lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about, right? Satoshi definitely, you know, the Genesis block, all that, that's that's walk up or ground. But, um, and, and, I, and I still think that's still like, the way Bitcoin cryptocurrencies have impacted society is, is being able to uh, offer this decentralized, deflationary uh, alternative to what I think are fundamentally broken financial economic systems. Um, but uh, aside from that, you know, I think two other really cool examples I always think about. One is uh, someone actually used the Ethereum blockchain uh, and the nonces to be able to share censored stories. And so in, in China, in the People's Republic of China, there uh, was a story, um, some people may know the, the famous whistleblower doctor, Dr. Li Wenyang, uh, who died of uh, COVID-19 uh, after whistleblowing about it and being reprimanded by the local police. Um, and so the emergency department where he worked at, there was actually a doctor originally, Dr. Ai Fen, who wrote about how she was the, the whistleblower giver. So there were like five or six uh, Wuhan doctors that were punished for talking about SARS-CoV-19. And so she actually wrote this article that got published on Chinese state media, but it got taken down very quickly because she was very, very honest about um, you know, how she saw things. And uh, they actually put the in entirety of the story. Uh, it, I wrote about it for Forbes actually, so you can actually get to the exact block height of this particular block, but they, they, someone actually put in the entire story uh, into one of the Ethereum blocks so that it could never be taken down. Um, and it was one of like many of these approaches. And so I thought that was really interesting. And then another one that, that I, I find really interesting is you have you know, different organizations that are using uh, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, decentralized alternatives to be able to fundraise. Um, and in ways that they might not. So they use stuff like BTC Pay. Um, and because the whole idea is that, you know, you have these conventional banks uh, and they may forbid you. Uh, so, for example, in Hong Kong, um, HSBC has closed the accounts of some uh, legislators that are more pro Democrat or more pan Democrat. Um, and so you have, for example, Hong Kong Free Press, uh, which is an outlet that writes about you know, pro-democracy issues in Hong Kong. You have the feminist coalition in Nigeria that's raising money through, through Bitcoin. And it's not like they're, uh, you also have this organization called BISOL, which is helping 
uh, people in Belarus, employees in Belarus who are protesting against the government to uh, raise funds. And I think these examples are really interesting because oftentimes it's not, they're not actually using these technologies because uh, they want to. Uh, it really is a meaningful hedge. Uh, so for example, in the case of Nigeria, uh, Flutterwave, which is kind of like the, the main commercial processor, has shut down accounts uh, related to protests, uh, the NSARS protest movement in Nigeria. And that's because they have a very close relationship with the Nigerian Central Bank. Um, and so when you see examples like this, I think it's, it's that's when decentralization hits home. It's like, that's why this all this talk really matters, because uh, you're not just talking about um, the abstract kind of like, oh, um, you know, we're trying to get away from the banks. This is like the banks have forced these organizations into only accepting money in, in uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So, yeah, those are my kind of my, my two or three examples. <laughs> Roger, thanks so much for shedding light on very critical issues that we have in society as of today. So it really sounds like this whole censorship and freedom of rights, digital rights, is one, at least is one of the, the factors that really motivated you. You also seem to be really like involved when it comes to racial or political, political biases. Do you also like that kind of factor or part of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies that it does not vet people? You don't have, it doesn't matter which passport, which nationality. Is that also something that resonates with you? Yeah, I think it resonates with me a lot um, because, you know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand, at, maybe like not at the deepest level, but like trying to understand, for example, what happens with borderless people. Um, and so I was, I was in at one point. I went to Timwata, uh, and then another point, I went to Athens and just kind of uh, tried to understand, you know, what it's like um, to be completely citizenshipless or it's completely borderless. Um, and what's really interesting with that is like they have an internet connection, like most refugee claimants, asylum seekers, they, they have devices, they have the internet. But what they don't have is obviously a citizenship. They don't have the ability to be able to access these different uh, either banking systems or anything that we might ascribe in the conventional sense. And, and this is a larger and larger and larger proportion of the world. And so it's always fascinated me um, that, and I'm taking like the most extreme example, right? Like the most extreme example is you, you can get people who literally have like no country recognizes them and they are still able to access the system. And then, you know, obviously within uh, different systems, right, whether it's the American political system, the Chinese political system or whatever, um, I think it's really fascinating that people can enter into this ecosystem and they're measured by their contribution, right? And they're not, they're no, they're not like gatekeepers in the sense of like hard gatekeepers. There's, there are soft gatekeepers and there's a lot of talk, you know, People in the community are very aggressive, adamant about certain ideas, right? And, and you know, if you're um, maybe not, if you don't want to be kind of tested by the fire a little bit, like maybe you want to stay away from that. But there are no hard gatekeepers. Like no one can stop you from participating. No one can stop you from running a node. No one can really stop you from paying someone in Bitcoin or receiving something from Bitcoin or, or being part of the community or creating tutorials. Uh, and in fact, that behavior is oftentimes encouraged. Right. So that to me is, I think, a very, very powerful concept, because to me, the most one of the most fascinating parts of decentralization is is how what it really means when you get rid of uh, the hard gatekeepers. Right. The people who say you can't participate in this political or economic system because of where you were born or arbitrary factor X or arbitrary factor Y. So, so yeah, that, that is a very interesting part to me about this. So that was fascinating, Roger. So, you know, many people in this space like to see Bitcoin or define it as the crossroads or intersection of digital gold and electronic cash, you know, with absolute scarcity, et cetera, et cetera, all these cool properties and things like that. But what would be your personal definition, Roger? Obviously, it sounds like it's more geared towards financial and personal liberty, digital rights. How would you personally define Bitcoin and its most appealing uh, parts for you? Yeah, I think I want to be, you know, I want to start off by saying the deflationary part is very important to me too, right? Okay. Like, I think, I think like, you know, when you look at central banks around the world, um, I, I studied monetary economics, I studied the response to 2008, 2009. Uh, my personal opinion is that there were some things that were, that, that were, that were wrong. Um, I, can, I can go at length about this, but um, this is more of a, a general interview, so I won't. But suffice it to say that I, you know, obviously, 
um, as a citizen of a country, I don't really have that much power to have a say over that particular system. But with Bitcoin, I think as an alternative, right? Like, I think that's very important. And so to me, like, that's one thing I, I want to stress too, is like that part is very appealing to me. I think that part is essential. It's important. It's, it's a fulcrum upon which all this rests. But um, the other part of it that I find really interesting is the community that it's gone across. Um, because what I found with Bitcoin others and some other cryptocurrency communities too, um, but but mostly in the Bitcoin community, I have to, I have to add, um, is that there is an interesting ideological intersect um, where people, you know, who quote unquote see themselves as part of the left or quote unquote see themselves as part of the right, like they're all unified in this idea that, um, you know, that we want to tend towards uh, more individual freedoms. We want to tend towards more individual liberty. Like in, in all things equal in, in these systems that we're trying to create, we want to be able to uh, lower the level of gatekeepers. We want to be able to uh, lower the power of unelected technocrats and, and be able to get back to the people and be able to get back to more democratic consensuses. So, you know, Bitcoin to me, when, when people ask me, you know, is it digital cold? Is it this? It, you, people are all working on all kinds of different facets of it, right? Like there are many people who are working on the core property. Um, you know, there are many different debates uh, and there are many different, you know, forks and things like that, that really, that really like get at the heart of, um, you know, whether or not Bitcoin will forever be a deflationary asset. Right. Uh, and I think that's a very important part of the element. There are people working on the, the means of exchange, right? There are people, Lightning Network, uh, Lightning Nabs, and just the work that they're doing. And, uh, but I, I think the really interesting part is how these two intersect. Um, and, 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 and the foundation of it has to be those things I mentioned, you know, like there is not really anything without it being a means of exchange or without it being some variant of, of, of digital scarcity. But um, also just the way the community thinks and operates, right? Like the way that miners interact with nodes, interact with, uh, different community stakeholders. Um, I think this is like a very interesting dynamic because it's it's inherently more democratic, perhaps than than a lot of the way monetary policy is, is currently governed, right? Um, which is very far removed from from the people. Despite what people, you know, despite like, yes, there are clean public records of meetings, there are clean meeting notes and stuff like that. But the language. Um, and the way monetary policy and, and these things are conducted is conducted in a way that's that I think is fundamentally anti-democratic. Um, and I think that, you know, the community around Bitcoin is trying to remove that by making stuff like Bitcoin more accessible to people. The tutorials that are coming out, the education. So you want to get everyone involved um, and uh, allowing everyone to be able to participate as a node, as a miner you know, as anything else. Um, Very nicely put, Roger. And, you know, I want to ask you a question because as you were talking about deflationary, right, that's something that we haven't really covered well on this show. And I remember, you know, when I used to take my economic classes, you know, all teachers would say inflation is good, deflation is bad, healthy inflation is this, unhealthy inflation is that. Uh, but can you tell us a little more on the whys? You know, why, what is the specific deflationary aspect of Bitcoin that really matters? And if you could elaborate on that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean the well. So, so uh, we we live in a world now where essentially um, it, it's completely uh, rule of uh, rule of man almost to a certain degree, right? And it, it, it's, before there used to be some constraints or some natural law constraints. I, I mean, the gold standard itself was something that people always talk about. I, I you know, there's some qualms back and forth. Uh, there's some really interesting research on how the gold standard is actually very of France and US based. Um, so it wasn't a perfect proxy, but the idea was that just like with encryption or something else, right? Um, that you could restrain um, human kind of like uh, control over certain things. Like, so the idea was that like, I mean, there there is like kind of a finite uh, amount of gold that can be mined and can be converted. And so that's backed by something, right? But now we live in this world where when it comes to fiat currencies, right, um, any bank can determine, and they're loosening progressively their, uh, for example, the Bank of Japan, I was just reading, they, they've stopped doing this, but they had, they had gone to the point where they got, they decided they could buy ETFs, um, exchange traded funds onto their balance sheet, right? 
Um, in the United States, you know, you've seen different things being put on their asset sheets. You've, you've seen open market operations that um, in, a, in a very broad sense means printing money. I mean, I don't want to, there, there's like a lot of like mechanical stuff that's going on, you know, in terms, but, but the, the broadest point possible I can make is that yes, the money supply is being expanded. Um, it is um, somewhat arbitrarily determined. I mean, um, you, you know, when you when you look at the Federal Reserve and you look at the, the way they've responded to this current crisis, their only response has been to lower rates or lower interest rate targeting and their, and to expand the money supply in the hopes that, you know, there will be a recovery. And, and you saw the same thing in 2008, 2009, and it, it creates a host of problems um, because, ironically, you know, asset inequality is very up because the, the way it works is that the Fed, by by bumping up all these, all these this money supply on those markets, what hits first is assets. So of course you see stock markets recovering, um, and and who has access to those stock markets? It's like the ten percent richest of Americans, disproportionately, right? Who own a disproportionate percentage of those. And, and so when we talk about an inflationary context, we're really talking about um, this particular element where there's no control, and now. The, the Federal Reserve and central banks are able to expand the money supply at will, and, and the consequences are kind of going to hit us in many different ways, right? One consequence that the Federal Reserve seems to be underrating, because they can't measure it properly, is the amount of inflation. And what that means is that our fiat money is worth less and less. It just is an axiom. I mean, the more and more that's available, whether through you know fiscal policy, where you just get people just getting checks, or whether through monetary policy, through the expansion of the monetary base, there's just more of it. And so inherently, it's going to be worth less. And, and you see yeah. the US dollar you know, is decreasing in value uh, against other currencies. I think yeah. it's down you know, um, 10 or 15% against other major currencies. But also, yeah. also, I mean, measured against Bitcoin, if you think about it, right? Like, is is Bitcoin's increase because of yeah. de- Bitcoin is a deflationary asset, or is it because the USD itself is fundamentally yeah. losing some some, some value and, and and the unit of account that we're using to measure it? And so that's why I think you know having deflationary assets is very interesting because you start seeing some behavior that that is predicted with deflationary assets. So for example, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, people are taking it off exchanges. They're like storing it, and there there's like some cash of it where people are actually going to uh, hold it, um, and that's actually not what central banks and and uh, and and uh, and, uh, and fiscal like governments want. They want you to spend as much money as possible now to rescue this economy that's been shattered because it's been held under lockdown for a year and a half, right? And 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 because economics economists were not able to predict the the effects of of a, a medical epidemic, right? It's something that happens once every twenty years, I would say. Um, now you have this this disastrous effect where the economy is shut down and and we can argue back and forth on that i'm not particularly interested but if we accept that this is this is what has happened you know then uh the idea is like the only response is uh this kind of like monetary expansion and so you you see two very different visions you see people the fed and central banks and governments trying to be like hey, you need to spend as much money as possible because we're going to make your savings environment miserable. Like, you need to be a good citizen and go out and consume now. Um, and on the flip side, you have people who are saying, like, no, I, I, I want to save. I want to save for my future. I want to take out from, yeah. from these assets. And that's why it's so important to have a deflationary asset like Bitcoin. The one thing I'll point out, because I, I know originally you would all approach me on, on the article on the environment, is that... All of this, um, people always talk about, oh, like Bitcoin, environmental waste, and this is and yeah, this yeah, stuff yeah. like that. All of this stuff we're talking about, this inflationary asset, um, it will have disastrous impact on, on, the, on the environment, on climate change. If we, if we see that as a goal, because, you know what, because the, the thing that they're trying to do with all of this is to create a present value, an artificial present value of money so that you spend as a consumer as much as possible. You get all these checks, you get all this 
money. They, they want to get this money into the economy in order to reduce unemployment, get back to like, you know, quote unquote, a regular economy. And that is all going to create massive carbon emissions. I mean, for example, China, its five year plan, if you read through the lines, what it's saying is that because of COVID, we are now not going to be carbon neutral until 2060. Uh, and we are going to have to pay for that for for environmental access. So when people talk about environmental waste, I think it's 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 very interesting because there's there is a basic hypocrisy to this. Thank you so much for the answer, Roger. So this brings me many ideas. Number one, we're talking about the U.S. dollar. And by the way, that's a really good point. A lot of people are wondering, is it really Bitcoin going up or is the U.S. dollar going down? So <laughs> that's a really good point that you raised earlier. And I think it's it's a fair uh, idea to to think about. But I, it brings me to the gatekeeper idea, you know, and you were talking about the U.S. dollar. And, you know, a lot of people say, like, the regulatory aspect is quite a threat to Bitcoin, especially if it's trying to become this global reserve currency and the co conflict with the U.S. dollar. Uh, how do you see that playing out? And by the way, this question comes from Vitor, one of our com community members. We love you, Vitor. Thank you so much for such an amazing question. Yeah, um, no, this, this is something, this is a topic that comes up really often. Um, I think that um, one, the first thing I would say is that it, it can't just be the U.S., right? Like the U.S. can't just utilize, Bitcoin has gotten to the point where it's so international, so decentralized, there are nodes all over the place, there are exchanges, there are people trading in it, um, that I don't think one single country, not just the U.S. or the PRC or even the European Union, can shut it down by itself. Um, the U.S. can do a lot of things, right? Like the, there were a few things that were proposed. For example, uh, I think the Treasury Department was looking at regulations uh, when it comes to uh, uncustody wallets. Uh, so wallets that were not hosted on exchanges like Coinbase. Um, and, and, you know, I was actually in a discussion with a few people who, who are, again, I'm not a regulator, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, having some discussions with people in the field on this, you know, who, who are convinced that there, there, may, there may actually be a fork in Bitcoin if that happens, right? If there are dramatic regulations. But there, are, you know, there, there are a few things in the American context that I think prevent Bitcoin from being totally banned. One is that, um, I'm paraphrasing here, but like code is basically free speech. And so I think that, you know, the ability to be able to modify, to, to run Bitcoin code, to run Bitcoin nodes, I don't think that's ever really going to be contested. Like you would have to throw the baby out with the bathwater the United States would have a lot of pro more problems if somehow, you know, running code was banned. Um, that would be a very different United States than the one that we currently have. Um, and then I think, you know, when it comes to the regulatory environment, um, yeah, there, you, you know, I don't think, I, I do think most countries still don't think of Bitcoin as like this massive threat. It's, it's been mentioned a few times. Xi Jinping, like mentioned in a few plenum speeches, obviously Christine Lagarde, has mentioned it as funny money, quote unquote. Uh, I wrote about that for Forbes. Um, and so you have like, you know, Janet Yellen has obviously made her remarks. And, and so obviously like, you know, people are aware. I, I don't think most countries still think of it as like a very big threat. Um, but the point I would make is that uh, all the countries would have to align with each other to, to, to really destroy Bitcoin at this point, um, which I find hard to believe. Uh, I do think, I do think, I do think there is a world where now um, so, for example, like uh, the United States and the European Union could get together. I, I think that's that's more plausible now that Biden, I think, is, you know, more traditionalist. Blinken seems to be more of a traditionalist. The European Union seems to be, you know, but, you know, do you want to get like China involved and then like India and then like, <laughs> you know, there, um, as, as you all probably saw it, it, with the Alaska uh, sort of newscast, um, the People's Republic of China and the United States are not in the best place relationship wise. Would they unify and get together to destroy the scourge of Bitcoin? I doubt it. But if, if, if that were indeed the case, then Bitcoin will have grown up much stronger than it currently is, I think. Um, so, so I think that's like one thing I, I would just ping from a regulatory standpoint. And then the other thing is like, you know, there are countries that for lack of a better, you know, and people don't like talking about this, but like, for example, like Iran and Venezuela, yeah. are like very involved with Bitcoin. Um, and, and this is from like kind of like a government level almost. Like I've talked to some primary secondary sources who know what, what are happening in the ground there. And there are seizures of miners and there, there's usage of that. And, and and the answer is quite, you know, it's quite honest. It's just like these are countries that are cut off from the SWIFT system. These are countries cut off from the U.S.-based uh, international finance and trade settlement system. 
um, that are kind of like using it. Um, and so they're, you know, Bitcoin in a weird way already has kind of country level support. And so, yeah, I think it would, I think it would require some kind of crazy, like all the political classes. All get the political, yeah. Classes. Yeah. And then just, you know, and then, and then even the mechanics of it would be like pretty weird because mm -hmm. like some countries yeah. would be very restrained in what, how they could approach it versus other countries. Right. Like, for example, like if you could ban running Bitcoin nodes, then you could ban running Tor. I mean, I don't, I don't think that's something that like the European Union, that Germany especially, would look like very fondly upon, right? Because like tons of people who run exit nodes in Tor are actually in based in Germany. Um, and so there's there's a lot going on there that like, I, I think like, you know, in order to attack Bitcoin, like you could go like uh, scorched, uh, scorched earth, earth. But, but it requires uh, the governments of the world to get together, uh, which I think is highly unlikely. And then it also requires within each government, like they're they're not. I mean, unless you assume a world where where every every government is a dictatorship or total dictatorship, in which case, you know, um, individual liberty and Bitcoin will have totally lost, and we'll all be like in some version of Star Wars instead. Um, but but each each government approaching this will have its own constraints, so that you, you can't you know some countries would all, would not be able to ban. Bitcoin nodes. Some countries would not be able to really ban exchanges. Um, some countries would not be able to ban peer-to-peer -peer exchanges or decentralized exchange. So would it be fair to say, Roger, that, you know, let's imagine the worst case scenario, like the apocalyptic type uh, scenario. So we have Biden, we have Christine Lagarde, Xi Jinping, and all the biggest political parties who decide to reunite and do agree to, to ban Bitcoin regulatory-wise. Obviously, the code is not something they'll be able to do. They can't even take down torrent sites. So they wouldn't be able to stop Bitcoin. But what would happen in that type of scenario? Would it just be that the Bitcoin price would go down for a little while? Would it stifle innovation and, and adoption for a little bit? But eventually, because just like banning tobacco and alcohol, which tends to have, you know, a bit of a drop in terms of usage, but then picks up and ends up even higher, and then they'll eventually have to open up. Well, what does that apocalyptic scenario look like for you as the biggest threat for Bitcoin? And what would the years be like after that, if you don't mind? I know it's a crazy question. You have no crystal ball, but let's ha let's have fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just a random person on the internet just before I answer this question, right? Um, but there's a lot of like mechanisms that make it easier, right? Like the Great Firewall is something that's already set up so that, you know, they could they could like, you know, the, the Chinese government could decide like, hey, we're going to try to shut down like anything that's like Bitcoin protocol related at, at the protocol level. Like th th that's a primitive that's already set up. Um, there's apocalyptic scenario. But like, look at, okay, let me put it this way, right? Like criminalization doesn't end things. It's, it's never ended things. Right. Like if that was the case, look at like cocaine and look at like drugs. Right. Like even in the, in the bear case, like when people want something and I, and I, I do believe that no matter what amount of criminalization is applied, people are going to value their individual freedom. They're going to value the ability to be able to make private transactions. They're going to, be, they're going to value the ability to be able to make uh, transactions that can't be censored. Um, and so, you know, like you can't like criminalize those demands in a way. And, and you know, when you look at stuff like people getting on signal, and this is a demand that's like more and more, right? Like people, people just don't want the the idea that other people might be, you know, intercepting or or interfering with the way they communicate. And and money is one of the the most uh, primitive of freedoms. Like how I choose to spend my money, how I how who I choose to give it to, what I choose to buy is like a fundamental freedom, right? So I I, I don't think you know again. Even in the apocalyptic worst scenario, that demand will always exist. And like, it, if you even criminalize it to that, like, someone will always try to fill that demand, right? And, and Bitcoin will always have like that kind of uh, uh, network effect. And I think Bitcoin is actually well set up to be resilient to this kind of those kind of shenanigans, yeah, right? Um, so where it's decentralized already, because the default assumption of Bitcoin, which is really funny, is that all of this is going to happen. Right. Like like the, this is like the, the absolute bear case. And it's something that's already been adjusted for. I mean, obviously, if Bitcoin was just, you know, a series of banks running different ledgers with each other, which some versions of cryptocurrencies are I'm not going to name names, but some of them are, um, you know, then, then it's very easy to shut down. Um, you just yeah. go to the bank and you say or you go to whatever organization and you say you are a, a 
US based or whatever, your employees are blah, blah, blah. Like you need to shut this down or else we will come after you. We will arrest you, we'll arrest whatever, right? But like Bitcoin is like global. You can like play off different countries. You can, you know, be resilient in that regard. It really assumes already that no country would trust it. So it's already like a trustless kind of network yeah, that absolutely. doesn't require that. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of like my thinking on that. And look, like with cocaine, I mean, a lot of people still make a lot of money on cocaine, not to directly compare Bitcoin to cocaine, <laughs> but a lot of people still make it. And um, I don't have any experience with this, but apparently it's still flowing all over the world. Right. And it corrupts politicians all the time. It's so absolutely. It's, it's, absolutely. It's, uh, so it's uh, by the way, one thing you were mentioning, Roger, earlier, which is really funny because my dad actually lives in Iran and the Revolutionary Guards in Iran called the SEPA, they, they, they were mining so much Bitcoin that they shut down the electricity of an entire town just for mining Bitcoin. So like you said, you know, all these countries going through hyperinflation or any countries will be welcoming the Bitcoin wealth uh, with great open arms yeah. if anyone tries to regulate. And by the way, Christine Lagarde, if you were looking, do not try to beat Bitcoin, join it. Don't, if you can't beat it, then join it. That's the message for Christine Lagarde. Uh, but I would love to ask you, so do you, do you see, uh, Roger, like Bitcoin possibly becoming that global reserve currency for the people rather than for the governments one day? What is the, the ultimate destination for you? I, I would hope so, right? I mean, that, that's, that's, what, that's, that's my, my fervent hope. I think there's a lot of work that needs to, to go there. Um, you know, when I look at like David Chom and, and Hal Finney and, you know, how they thought about these things, I think they had the, the right vision for this kind of stuff. I think that, you know, you need to benefit from digitization. Um, but the, the flip side of digitization is there are a lot of consequences, right? Like um, digital payments allow us to transact with each other quickly without uh, too many intermediaries without too, uh, without too many processing fees, um, you know, especially when it comes to larger and larger amounts, right? And so I, I, I very, very much hope that the global reserve currency is going to be one that's independent, that's decentralized, that's controlled by all kinds of different people from across the world, right? It would be very fitting as opposed to the global reserve, now the global reserve currency is the USD, unquestionably, unquestionably. Um, you know, central banks hold it the most, uh, even the People's Republic of China, who is, uh, you know, I think the United States, a huge competitor, they, they said something, and one of those finance ministers said something that was like, you know, we hate you, can't do anything about it. You just keep on printing treasuries and debt. Like, you just, like, we can't do anything about it. There is bought in, right? Like, I think something like, 55 or 50 percent could be wrong the exact figure but in 2015 at least 55 percent of the foreign reserve holdings were treasuries so like just the usd and us debt instruments are still like the reserve instrument and, and it's crazy and i think like i think in the future we're gonna look back and be like wow this is like crazy world crazy, where like yeah. we depend where we depended on like at like 350 million people who vote like once every four years to like basically determine the like global macroeconomic stability, the, the USD, like, because the USD is not even built for people around the world. And, and we see this all the time, right? When the effects of this, like the USD is built, the Fed is strictly looking at the employment rate of Americans. <laughs> like they don't, you know, the Fed is not like, they, they've been open more and more because, you know, currency swaps or whatever, because other central banks affect the, the domestic American. But at the end of the day, they are an American agency that is responsible to Congress that is looking at like, how do we maximize American jobs? And the fact that so many countries around the world are bought into the system that's like literally about maximizing American jobs makes no sense. And it creates all kinds of weird effects, right? Because then you have all these developing country crises because the USD goes up and they're, all their debts are denominated in USD or the USD goes down and all the reserves are held in USD. It's like a disaster. They, they don't have control over their own even. So, I think Bitcoin is, is is much more democratic when it comes to that, right? It, like I mentioned before, it can even include the stateless. It can include anybody, um, and so I think I think we're we're gonna realize that that's that's what makes sense. And um, the the flip side of that is I, I don't want a global currency that's like controlled by some kind of like global central bank that's not responsive to, you know. I, I think which is another disastrous direction that that Bitcoin yeah. I think hedges against. So so to me, I, I fervently hope it's Bitcoin. 
Um, but yeah, I, again, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. I don't think too, and I've done a lot of research on this and someone, please come up to me, reach out to me on Twitter if I'm wrong, but there is no central bank that has publicly disclosed that they hold Bitcoin. Right. And, yeah. and obviously, obviously in the power dynamic, it's, it's the USD. And I would point out the euro is the second. A lot of people think about the yuan, but the euro, euro is, is usually second as well. There's, and then the yuan, then it's like kind of the yen. But in any case. That is a beautiful note to end this interview on. I think, you know, just summarizing all the, the superpowers that Bitcoin has as potentially becoming, hopefully becoming a global reserve currency. Uh, any last messages? I know, like, Roger, you love the community and obviously they're watching out there. Is there one last message you'd like to share to the community? Um, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate everybody who kind of uh, comes in and uh, interacts with either like my articles or, or things that come up. Um, you know, several times, I think people have actually just reached out to me on Twitter and, and they, they've forced me to be better um, at, you know, whether it's like correcting certain things, whether it's, it's, it's different things. Uh, maybe I was wrong on a specific figure. I was wrong on a specific thing. And so uh, I love kind of the, the Bitcoin cryptocurrency community in general for being able to be bold enough to be able to come up and, and say like, hey, this is wrong. And, and you know, how, how can we get better together? So in that spirit of like improvement, um, I just I just hope the community keeps on maintaining that, um, creating more tutorials, getting more people accessible um, to Bitcoin um, in, in all the languages of the world. Um, and so I hope that kind of spirit continues. Um, that's like the one thing I would end on is I love the spirit of the Bitcoin community and, and some of the other cryptocurrency communities out there. Like the, the spirit of being just as inclusive as possible. Um, I know it seems like it's rough because people are like debating and sparring over ideas, but at the end of the day, nobody can stop you from participating. Um, and I think just having that kind of inclusive democratic dialogue where people can be nodes, people can contribute to the code, people can uh, mine, people can be part of this process, I think is just so important. And I, I hope that spirit continues. I sure do hope that spirit continues. Code is love. Uh, that's the conclusion, right? It's all about the community. It's all about the spirit about the love, universal language through code. Thank you so much, Roger, for coming on the show and for sharing not just, you know, the economic side, the financial side of Bitcoin, but the social impact, the political impact, the global impact, Bitcoin as the next global reserve currency and many other cool topics that were uh, debated today that were discussed today. So guys, if you like this show, don't forget to like, comment and blast that bell notification so that you get access to more timeless interviews like this. Thank you so much, guys. See you every week premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. Peace out, guys. Peace.